a familiar shell with some powerful components. I got massively delayed finishing my review on this mini PC. If you've been subscribed to my channel, you're probably sick of me talking about my issues with Ace Magic. They sent over a laptop and this desktop for me to test drive and share some thoughts. And both systems, manufactured around the same time, flagged my malware scans. It's a situation the company has been dealing with over this last year, but it's the first time I've run into this specific issue on a device sent to me for review. Rather than tuck that away, I've been trying to work out a strategy publicly. Now, first just detailing the situation, and then I did a follow-up interview with my friend, Shannon Morse, who goes by Snubs. She's a security expert, and I kind of picked her brain about best security practices for setting up a new PC. Both of those videos and the laptop review are linked below, and you can also find them on my home site, somegadgetguy.com. But I still have a piece of hardware here. It's still available on retail sites, and I think it's still important to contribute to a discussion about the system and share my experiences publicly. This is the Ace Magic AD08, and it should look a little familiar. This is a popular gaming style alternative shell for a mini PC. The more traditional form factor is what we see from the Intel Nook clones, that 4x4 mini square. A few labels now have opted for a vertical mini tower, which gives us a bit more room to work with. This style won't be quite as versatile as the 4x4 mini systems. It really is designed to live on a desk as a little pyramid of compute power, where a 4x4 shell can be bolted to the back of a computer monitor or a TV on a vase mount. This can't be bolted to the back of a TV, but it does include an upgradability perk. Rather than a series of screws on the bottom feet, the side panel is only stuck on with some magnets, and this affords us easy access to the RAM, the, uh, the M.2 SSD, and we've got this bottom tray for a SATA SSD. I'll list the full specs somewhere on the screen. The highlights for the model I'm reviewing, this is a 12th gen Core i9, a 12900H, with 32 gigabytes of RAM and a 512 gig M.2. Whether you think this is charming or frustrating, there are always these little mistakes in the spec sheet on these systems, like one page says that this has gigabit ethernet and another saying it has 2.5 gig ethernet. It's the 2.5. Core i9 is a beefy CPU. We've got Intel integrated graphics, but no Thunderbolt. I don't believe there's any support here for an external GPU, but it can handle triple 4K displays between the HDMIs on the back and the USB-C on the front. And this arrived with a big boy power supply. A lot of these mini systems come with smaller power bricks, but this is a Core i9 and that lump needs to be able to supply up to 120 watts to this system. There isn't any fancy system software for handling performance, but this case has a fun feature around the power button where we have this knob that acts like an old PC turbo button. You roll it between three positions, from near silent, a more balanced fan profile, or we can change this up to a performance curve. It's fan cooling first. The user controls the fans, and then that sort of dictates how the rest of the system is going to perform. If it's near silent and the system's getting too warm, it's going to throttle down the CPU and the GPU internally, and that's sort of the performance profile you're going to get. It's a delightfully beefy little rig, and the case complements that performance with some cute... RGB lighting. The RGBs totally make it go faster. But seriously, a 12900H is a punchy system still. We're moving into the new era of Core Ultra, but the jump from a 12900H to a 13900H, and again to a new Core Ultra 9 185H, side note, I do not like Intel's new processor labels. We're honestly only seeing small iterative changes in CPU performance. Now, there's been a bigger uptick in GPU performance with the GPU move to Arc graphics on the new Core Ultra. But for a chip released in 2022, the 12900H is not struggling against heavier compute workloads today. And we haven't moved the needle much on higher performance from this kind of laptop or mini PC on an Intel chipset. Now, against a newer AMD chip like a Ryzen 7 or a Ryzen 9, I don't think we'd always see a clear winner across every single benchmark. There'd be a bit more play between wins and losses, but I'd have to give a general edge for AMD on performance per watt. In a laptop, I think that's gonna be a bit more important, but 
on a mini desktop that might not be as precious depending on what kind of deal you can get, what kind of price you can find a system like this for, and what your specific needs might be. Getting into my specific testing, I don't think synthetic benchmarks help tell us much about application performance. But as a baseline with some Geekbench scores, Intel demonstrates a solid single core score. But multi-core falls behind the newer AMD 7735HS I recently reviewed in a similar pyramid chassis. That Ryzen chip kind of became my baseline for a lot of these tests, and it's a step down in AMD's lineup a Ryzen 7 chip instead of a more premium Ryzen 9. In a graphics bench, I got solid numbers out of the Core i9. These are good results for an integrated graphics chip, but again, the newer AMD can outpace the 12900. Putting the CPU scores into some kind of practical scenario, I, I do a file compression test. The i9 is good, the Ryzen 7 is better, and that lines up with our multi-core synthetic CPU scores. And moving to something a little beefier, my video rendering test, the i9 demonstrates solid performance, and this little box is more than capable of handling some mid-level video editing in DaVinci Resolve. I really am impressed with the price to performance we can achieve these days where it wasn't that long ago. Building a decent home video editing rig would have been a lot more expensive. Performing a CPU render though, the AMD is noticeably faster, and it just gets worse for Intel integrated graphics when we do a GPU render and AMD's Radeon integrated graphics completely outclass Intel's GPU. As a purely anecdotal experience though, I think scrubbing my timeline was a little smoother on the i9. If that's differences in architecture or maybe optimization for Intel over AMD, I can't really say. But moving around and editing, I felt the i9 caught up to my 4K video clips a little better than the 7735HS. Now this is something I haven't done much testing on in the past, but I recently got to check out the demo systems from Qualcomm for their new X Elite chip. And their main point of comparison is the Core Ultra 7 155H. But given these browser benchmark scores, a Windows on ARM machine might be able to keep pace with a Core i9 or Core Ultra 9, and I'll have to cover this a bit more with laptops later this year. Putting a Core i9 in a mini PC like this is an interesting situation, because I think often the premier chips from AMD and Intel are often paired with a discrete GPU. So I'd love to hear in the comments, what kinds of workloads do you most anticipate when you want the top tier of CPU performance for that generation, but you're pairing it with only the integrated graphics. This style of mini PC, the, the pyramid shape, is often held up as a solution for gaming. And you can absolutely game on the AD08. And the older Intel graphics, honestly, are not terrible. Over the last year or so, my main threshold is, you know, can we keep with or maybe above the kind of experience I enjoy on my LCD Steam Deck? Starting lower with medium graphics and at 1080p resolution, Tetris Effect looks really good. This is a deceptively simple looking game, but with three dimensional tetrominoes, and you absolutely do not want any stutters in your frame rate when you're dropping blocks. Keeping up 60 frames per second here, this looks great. Now, my daughter has recently discovered Sonic the Hedgehog. Apparently Sonic is huge with grade schoolers right now. Who knew? But her favorite incarnation is Sonic Team Racing. And again, 1080p with medium graphics, I'm keeping near 60 frames per second with very reasonable lows. Not very surprising, these aren't the most extreme graphics tests for, you know, for recent PCs or for game consoles, but now we're stepping up to control. And this is the first game where I feel we see bigger differences between Intel and my newer AMD PC. It's a little more noticeable. I have to drop quality settings more at 1080p to stay near 30 frames per second, just while exploring the complex. It's totally playable, and it still looks a little nicer than my Steam Deck, but this is a step below what I can do on my Ryzen 7. Ditto, another deceptively heavy game, Hellblade. Just at the introduction, just walking around, this was better than I was expecting, but it's still mostly unplayable. We can click on FSR, and image quality takes a noticeable hit, but we'd be able to keep up with a much more reasonable frame rate. Shifting to Spider-Man Remastered, 
I couldn't find any combination of settings that would get frame rates above 30 FPS, but at 30 with some kind of image scaling like FSR, the AD08 performed well enough. Again, this is totally playable. For every example, games I, I really personally enjoy playing, this machine is turning out better results than I would have expected, but it consistently falls behind a less expensive machine like my AMD powered mini PC. But for the gamers in my audience, I do have one small concern with older Intel integrated graphics. Moving forward, I worry we're going to see more compatibility issues with games running Unreal Engine 5. The chip in here is DirectX 12 compatible but it doesn't seem to support the newer additions that we find in UE5, so a game like Robocop just won't load at all. It's frustrating and confusing, and no amount of digging through forums or looking up support articles, I, I have not gotten that game to work. That is partly a frustration with the developer that there is not a clearer explanation of what's going wrong. It's very upsetting to think that a, a decently expensive mini PC with a two-year-old Core i9 might already be obsolete for any games that follow suit in the future. It's a machine marketed on gaming, and that's one of the bigger buyer bewares I might have to offer. Now, I don't do a lot of lab quality benchmarking on power consumption, but this will require a bit more juice than that AMD machine, and I'm not sure how critically to rate that. I suppose it will come down to your specific needs, the kinds of applications you run, and what you pay for electricity, but under load, both systems are going to sound about the same. The AMD system sips a little less electricity, but it still needs to spin up those fans, and the fans are going to be active in the balanced or performance mode options with this little top dial, same as the system here. Both machines do a good job of quieting down when in moderate or casual use, especially on the silent profile. Trying to wrap all this up, I'm a little stuck on this one. Who I might recommend this machine to. It is sweet, delicious overkill for so many computer applications. But then it's also outpaced in a couple key areas by more affordable machines. A last important point as we wrap up this video, in concerns to the malware and improperly installed Windows software, the MSRP on this box really doesn't make sense. But as I finish up this review, the AD08 has regularly been on sales, and recently the price is looking pretty good. At this current sales price, I think it would be hard. I think it would be a challenge to pick up a Core i9 bare bones and also buy 32 gigabytes of RAM and a 512 gig SSD and install your own copy of Windows for less. My issues with the Ace Magic machines recently, I do not believe we've seen any evidence of other hardware tampering compromising the security of a system with some other kind of hardware addition to the motherboard or other internal system components. If folks have seen that kind of malfeasance, please immediately message me so I can also look for that and then address that in future videos. So far, it seems like a QA issue where malware was copied onto a system image and that was used improperly while flashing other systems and packaging these computers. That scenario is not great, but it means a fresh install of Windows and deleting all of the security partitions on the SSD should protect users from problems. Should protect users from issues. So I can't make the same kind of broad recommendation for the AD08 because of my recent issues with detecting malware, but I think a hobbyist or an enthusiast I mean, if you can find a good deal on this hardware and you go into this treating it like a bare bones system where you scrub out windows and you install a fresh copy of an OS, this could be a solid option for a powerful home machine at very competitive price to performance against a refurbed Mac mini. And against a Mac mini, we, we get the benefit of upgradable RAM and two options for increasing storage internally. Malware aside, I think the toughest challenge for the AD08 is this high-tier Intel chip, and how brutal the competition is from AMD. The Ace PC system I recently reviewed with that 7735HS wins most of the performance tests that matter to me while consuming a little less electricity, and it too is regularly on sale for a bit less than the sale price of the AD08. The competition is really the exciting part of this whole conversation as we look at different components and we look at different builds and we look at different form factors. 
there are some great options for consumers to shop. But of course, I want to hear from you. What am I missing? I have to believe there are tasks or workloads where an i9 might make more sense. And I would love to read some of your replies down in the comments below. As always, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos, sharing is caring, and subscribing to the channel. All the support lately has been absolutely fantastic. Those of you clicking on links, maybe you hit my home site, somegadgetguy.com, or maybe you've joined the list of names scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon. That's patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. This list is basically the coolest collection of tech pals in the universe, and these videos and reviews would literally not be possible without their support. I thank them from the bottom of my heart. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet, at some gadget guy, basically everywhere, but these days I'm spending a bit more time on the Mastodons, a lot less so on the Instagrams and the Facebooks, and definitely not on the Twitters, and I will catch you all on the next review.